Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Friday Rambling. We're here for a little more Justice Society goodness. We got a double shot of two characters who we kind of foreshadowed a few episodes back when we discussed the Starman legacy, and that is the two Star Spangled Kids. Now, I did talk about how technically the Charmaine legacy has continued on briefly through uh, Courtney Whitmore, who's currently known as Stargirl, but this episode's going to give a little more spotlight on Courtney as well as discussing her full connections to the Star Spangled Kid legacy as well. Because these characters deserve their own spotlight. So we start things off with Sylvester Pemberton, the original Star Spangled Kid. He first appeared in Star Spangled Comics number 1 in October 1941, created by Jerry Siegel and Hal Sherman. Now, the character did have his own sidekick named Stripesy. However, in a different twist for most of the Golden Age superheroes, this was a kid superhero with an adult sidekick as opposed to everybody else who were adult superheroes with kid sidekicks. Uh, Stripes, he also served as the Star Spangled Kids mechanic. Originally, Star Spangled Kid was merely one of many patriotic characters uh, during the early periods of World War II. Still, Sylvester and Stripesy, a.k.a. Pat Duggan, would appear in Star Spangled comic books until issue 86 in November 1948. Although the comic continued after that, it was primarily used as a vehicle for Robin the Boy Wonder. In issue 131, the book was renamed Star Spangled War Stories, and Star Spangled Kid would appear in World's Finest comics from 42 to 45. Now, the Star Spangled Kid was also a member of the All-Star Squadron, which was a team introduced in the 1980s, but taking place back during the, same, during the 40s. They were essentially a retcon team, as well as the Seven Soldiers of Victory, who were published back in the 40s, uh, originally by Mort Weisinger and Mort Meskin. Uh, this team was a short-lived assembly, some of the less famous superheroes, and however, some of their key battles as a team have become famous in the decades afterwards of people have done stories kind of saluting these underdog heroes of the Golden Age. Eventually, um, the Seven Soldiers would be lost in time in the 1950 and, and rescued decades later by a team up between the Justice League and the Justice Society. Aquaman, Wildcat, and Hal Jordan rescues the Star Spangled Kid who is 50,000 years in the past and hiding in a cave so his flu would not wipe out early humanity. Now, Sylvester would join the JSA after this, where he would serve as a replacement for the then injured Starman, who loaned him one of his cosmic rods. However, the kid decided to refine the technology of the rod into a cosmic converter belt and become and continue the legacy of the Star Spangled Kid instead of becoming a full-fledged Star Man. Eventually, however, Sylvester Pemberton, as he got older, decided to retire from super heroics to reclaim his inheritance and his father's business 
including the movie studio Stellar Studios, which was being run by his greedy and corrupt nephew, who had been using the funds to run his own evil organization, Strike Force. Uh, Pat Duggan, who, when it when the seven soldiers had been sent back in time, had ended up in ancient Egypt. Was also rescued during this adventure, however, when Sylvester went on to join the JSA, Pat Duggan did not. And there was a bit of fractured friendship. However, after retiring from Superheroic, Sylvester repaired that friendship with Pat Duggan, a.k.a. Stripesy. Good times. Perhaps much more important, though, than his time serving with any of these teams is when he would help found and chair the Infinity Inc. Infinity Inc. was composed primarily of the children of the Justice Society's founding members who, who felt that they had who felt they were ready to join the JSA. However, they were not. And along with Sylvester, who being much younger than the rest of the JSA, being basically the same age as their children, felt sympathetic and decided to go with them to found the team, Sylvester financially supporting the team. Uh, I've done another video on Infinity Inc. If you want to get really deep into details of them, uh, the long and short of it is that he would serve as a team leader for most of the team's existence, eventually changing his name to Skyman. However, shortly after doing so, he would be confronted by Solomon Grundy under the control of the third Harlequin, who was a bit fond of mind control and illusion casting. She herself was an employee of the dummies Injustice Unlimited. And during the incident, Solomon Grundy used the fatal touch of Mr. Bones to kill Skyman, thus ending Sylvester's adventures and the original run of the Infinity Inc. team. Now, before I jump over to Courtney, I'm going to re reference the fact that um, Sylvester Pemberton's estate was purchased by Lex Luthor post-Infinite Crisis, and the name Sky Man was given to a new superhero named Jacob Colby who was later killed and replaced by the villainous member of this new Infinity Inc. Everyman. So, we're kind of throwing him in, in as a bit of a footnote. Things happen. Uh, we should also mention that Sylvester Pemberton had a aforementioned sister, uh, Mary Pemberton, also known as Gimmick Girl or Mary Girl of a Thousand Gimmicks. Uh, she's the adoptive sister of Sylvester. She first premiered in Star Spangled Comics 81 in 1948. She would occasionally work with her brother and Stripesy before going off on her own. She would marry JSA supervillain Henry King Sr., a.k.a. Brainwave, they would have one son, Henry King Jr., who also took the name Brainwave and served as a member of Infinity, Inc., before having kind of a sometimes hero, sometimes villain history post-Infinity, Inc. Mary is occasionally referred to as having died, though she sometimes is not dead. It's kind of a weird thing. Ultimately, in um, the Grant Morrison's update to the Seven Soldiers of Victory concept the series simply called Seven Soldiers, a new character named Gimmicks appears, claiming to be Jacqueline Pemberton, Mary's estranged daughter, who has a similar bag of tricks to Mary. 
and she was the who herself would end up dying at the in the ill-fated first adventure of the seven soldiers that would start this mini series it is later revealed Jacqueline was the head of the Pemberton estate leading credence to the fact she was Mary's daughter and it was her death that allowed Lex Luthor to purchase the Pemberton state, estate and with it the intellectual rights to Infinity Inc. and the Skyman identity. There you go. Still, this brings us all to everybody's favorite teen female superhero. Heck, she's got her own live action TV show on the CW right now. Or whatever they're calling that network these days. It changes every 10 years or so. Um, we are talking about Courtney Elizabeth Whitmore. Originally appearing as the second Star Spangled Kid. She made her first appearance in, the, in Stars and Stripe. Stripe now being an acronym, S-T-R-I-P-E. A series created by Jeff Johns and Lee Motor. She was originally portrayed as a bratty Teenager and the newly and the new stepdaughter of the retired Pat Duggan, who had recently married Courtney's mother, Barbara Whitmore. The family having moved to Blue Valley, a nothing happening town in the middle of America. Courtney dislikes Pat and when, in the process of unpacking, she finds Sylvester's old cosmic converter belt and costume, decides to take advantage of a school festival to dress up as the Star Spangled Kid, modifying the outfit to be a bit more teenage girl. Um, the top, instead of it being a single leotard type deal with a full head cover piece, She's now just got a little mini mask over her eyes like Robin. Uh, the shirt exposes the belly and the top or the bottoms are now just a pair of shorts. Again, teenage girl. Pat Duggan then quickly reveals that he has a secret exoskeleton battle armor, hence the stripe acronym in the title. That he's been working on to compensate for the fact that he is older and not quite as strong and quick as he was back in Sylvester's day. The two quickly find out there are various misadventures going on in Blue Valley in a, this short run book that tends to be comedic as much as action filled. Still, Courtney manages to meet a couple other classic heroes, including former Seven Soldier Shining Knight, as well as some of the JSA founders, who Pat Duggan was still in somewhat regular contact with. And by the end of the series, she is one of the first of the modern wave of JSA student members. Initially, much like in her own series, only caring about superheroics in the sense of kicking butt. She, mostly through the work of the patient and understanding Alan Scott, starts appreciating the history of the Star Spangled Kid legacy, as well as eventually the JSA itself. This, along with her membership in the JSA and serving on much more serious missions against higher class villains starts Courtney's path towards being a hero in her own right. Thus, 
we get into, although I do love the comedic misadventures of bratty, smart-mouthed Courtney, this is where she really shines as a character. While, while with the JSA, she manages to meet current Starman Jack Knight and her father, or his father, Ted Knight. Jack finding her to be a bit annoying, but recognizing when she goes to Ted to have him look over the cosmic converter belt and verify it's functioning like it's supposed to, as well as helping her better understand all its functions, Jack recognizes that she does have the potential to be a great hero, and while he prefers to think of her as an irritating little sister, does give her props that she is at least doing as good a job in the hero business as he is. And when he sh shortly thereafter retires from superheroics, hands over his cosmic rod to Courtney, this becoming her primary weapon and source of power in battle, the cosmic converter belt being more of a backup as well as fashion accessory to go along with her costume. As I said though, through it all, she manages to very quickly prove herself as a member of the JSA in her own right, and due to her youth and ability to very quickly learn the ropes as a hero, serves as sort of a liaison between some of the later JSA recruits, such as Cyclone and Joaquin Thunder and the original crew such as Alan Scott, Jay Garrick, Wildcat often being the one to see the middle ground negotiation as the youngins want to go out there and kick butt and the old folks want them to appreciate the importance of strategy, tactical thinking, and making sure you actually know what this supervillain is going to throw at you powers-wise. She also manages to bond with experienced but still younger heroes that find their way into the Justice Society, such as Power Girl, and experiences a brief romance with Captain Marvel, a.k.a. Billy Batson. However, due to the fact that as Captain Marvel, Billy is seen to be a man in his late 20s, and Courtney is still only 16, you know, potentially 15, depending on what year of the book you're reading, as she was a high school freshman when her series began, and Captain Marvel not wanting to reveal his identity as, in reality, a teenage boy in his own right. To the JSA, there is a conflict that results in him having to leave the team. Sorry about that, folks. Still, while this little bit of heart heartbreak does bother Courtney in the short term, she continues to serve with the Justice Society in good stead, becoming a core member whose opinion is often respected as the series goes on, and even more characters introduced, such as the motor mouth Maxine Hunkel, Mm. Whew, too much recording tonight, folks. Guess I don't have superpowers myself, despite all this comic book talk of them. All of this means, by the time that JSA series ends, just in time for the new 52 and Flashpoint, Courtney is seen as a... valued and core member of the Justice Society who can 
get as much respect as any member, including the original Golden Age founders. Um, she'll also be noted similar to her drama with Captain Marvel. Courtney would find herself crushing hard on the older Adam Smasher himself, a part of Infinity Inc. back in the day as Nuclon, who would go on to serve as an off and on member of the team due to some bad ethical choices, uh, mostly concerning his friendship with a somewhat reformed but still a big jerk, uh, Black Adam. And the his splinter group of extreme prejudice solution oriented J JSAers and occasionally working for Mr. Bones and his government agency, the DEO. They eventually reach a point where Nuclon and Mitt or Adam Smasher, you know, whatever you want to call him, Al, admits that while he does love Courtney, it is not necessarily a romantic sense, though it is highly hinted that he was pressured into doing this by the founding members who were worried about the age difference between the two as well as Al's, you know, status as the black sheep troubled member of the JSA. Courtney would persevere through all this though, as she is a strong girl at heart. As I've said, Courtney herself has gone on to star in her own live-action TV series, which has incorporated a lot of Justice Society history into its continuity, including appearances by original star-spangled kid Sylvester Pemberton, who shows up having taken on the legacy of Starman. Um, Courtney, of course, as the show is called Stargirl, not Star-Spangled Kid, would... As we said before, upon Jack Knight's retirement, take up the Stargirl mantle. So she is a daughter of two legacies, although they are um, joined legacies due to, due to Sylvester's cosmic converter belt being adapted from the Starman Cosmic Rod. All good times. In many ways, though, I do have to say... Um, while I respect Sylvester's history and excellent leadership of Infinity Inc., Courtney is where it's at. It, she was the backbone of that modern JSA series that is one of the best runs of the last 30 years in comic books. And as I said, her solo series that debuted her is a good, light-hearted superhero comic that sets the stage of her being somebody that didn't take super heroics seriously because of her age and her original motivation of just wanting to annoy a stepfather she wasn't sure she wanted. Uh, on that personal note, I'm going to go ahead and throw, it, throw you a hashtag spoiler. She would eventually make peace with Pat, although continued to be embarrassed by his fatherly ways when he did show up to help the Justice Society with mechanic work or as a reserve member. Mostly after she confronted, for the first time in several years, her real father, who confirmed that he is a self-serving, criminal-minded scumbag. Letting Courtney down on two different major occasions and showing that she should have never put him up on that pedestal and wanted him to come back into her life. Thus, realizing her birth father was not any kind of real father at all, and that for all his dorky faults, Pat genuinely cared about her, she softens up on Pat as well. So, there you go. Courtney is what a lot of comic book characters should be character who's introduced is fun but has some rough edges that over a series of 
a good 10 years or so, is matures and polished, finding her way into being a great hero in her own right. Things had proceeded without Flashpoint, the New 52, and Convergence and Rebirth and all those things that mean that I just don't look at DC Comics anymore. Um, it's just so much of a headache. Damn you, DC. Still, had things proceeded along the original timeline, by all means, Courtney could have eventually earned a, a true solo series and probably had pretty good sales on it. Although we hope that if she had continued to age and grow and mature, she would have swapped out her costume for something a little less teenage girl, look at me. Hey, what can I say? I'm an old man. As much as I, as much as I try to read the comics for the superhero parts, you see a 16-year-old girl wearing short shorts and a shirt that shows off her belly and you've got two different plot points spread out over you know a few years gaps where there's hints of a romantic relationship between her and an older man the thoughts kind of creep in there and it's not something we really want to think about too hard I want to appreciate Courtney for the awesome personality that grew and matured in a respectful, heroic way. That's what she is to us. She is the little sister we all want to appreciate and in turn see grow into an awesome person who eventually buys a pair of pants. That's all I'm saying. Buy a pair of pants, Courtney. Although there was jokes in that one JSA book about her having to swap outfits because they went to a very snowy land and her normal outfit is just not appropriate for very cold places. So at least they did acknowledge it at one point in a fun way. Still, Sylvester, Courtney, we salute you in your star-spangled ways. And this is ultimately the end of our JSA Legacy look back. Uh, we're going to kind of do an epilogue episode next month where I go through some of the lesser tier Legacy identities. Just a quick little flash through. Um, because there were other characters in the JSA who were technically Legacies, but... Their legacy identities were not, were not high tier stuff. They were more like footnote things. So for them, they'll get a little bit of time. Still, join us for that and join us every week for the ramblings. Hopefully my coughing fits will be under control. And I appreciate all of the likes, all of the subscriptions all of the views and I would super appreciate it if you let you know if friends know about the awesome roulette productions channel because we do have content for you every week served up fresh till I see you again stay healthy stay happy since it is the winter season stay warm bye bye